and we had a, because he's Unitarian, I'm a Unitarian, so I saw him again at the, at the General Assembly in Portland where he was being filmed along with Dan Ellsberg. Bob and, uh, and Bob West. Yeah, who's the Unitarian publisher of the well, Unitarian, the, head of the Beacon Press, the Beacon Press, which published the Microbelts version of Magnum Papers, which I hear is the best version available out there. Now, and that's really a cloak and dagger story. Ali Ellsberg had the Pentagon Papers in his trunk and all points broken out with the FBI to try to find him. Micro, they were trying to get him to Gravel, who was uh, doing a filibuster against the draft. And finally, with all this cloak and dagger stuff, really fascinating. Uh, he finally gets it and puts it into the congressional record, which was the end of all attempts to do the <laughs> censorship at that time. It was filmed uh, by Amy Goodman, and she would interview him for Democracy Now. I never saw the film, but I was in there in the audience trying to uh, stand by the microphone to block up some softball questions to Mike. Um, so if, he's, if you ever see this, I've never seen it, but if that camera jumps over this because I was bumping the camera trying to get in line <laughs> and ask him the question. <coughs> Anyhow, um, I should mention in conclusion that um, he is going to be the um, title star of a future hit TV series. Remember, Eisenhower really had I Like Ike. And I can conclude no better than to conclude with the name of the TV series. It's going to be a smash hit in the U.S especially if you have um, um, Oliver, Stone. Oliver Stone produced it. Um, so I'll conclude by saying, I like Mike. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Uh, well, first off, let me establish some chair right there for you, right there or right there. Uh, I will discourse for a while. But then I really enjoy questions because you can't get thoughts across if you don't get your interpretation of what I've said so that I can either affirm or correct. So that's the rules. Now, if you'll, uh, if you'll give me, I know we've got an hour and something, but I'd like to spend at least uh, a half hour, three quarters of an hour with questions and dialogue. So that means that I'm gonna limit myself to about a half hour talking. Then you give me a sign so that I know, and then they'll give us close to an hour for Q&A yeah. and hey, discussion. Reception items will come here immediately around 2.45. So naturally, can we can We can slip into the reception. Yeah, we can probably do both things. It, it's whatever pleases the group. To yeah. want to discuss. And all of your guests for the yeah, Got another one coming. God, open that door. We've got to need, need every guest we can. Telephone. 
And Jobs has come out with now the tablet, which I'm going to wait six months a year before I get it because I, I'm still learning this one. And I've had this for two, three years. But, it, but this is awesome technology. It's at our, at our fingertips. And that's what science has done for us, science in medicine, uh, science in, uh, in farming, uh, you name it. You look around and you're awestruck as to how well off we are as a human race. However, it's the worst of times because with this scientific advancement, we have willy-nilly put ourselves in a position of total self-destruction. Now, we see the immediate self-destruction dragging out with the environmental problem. And it's slow. It's a slow death. And so unless we can get a handle on correcting what we do in the environment, uh, we will die. There's just no two ways about it. And we're not doing a good job of that. Secondly, you've got the atomic era. Uh, he doesn't say much about it. But he is a physicist uh, from uh, Southern California, and at one point was going to work for a Lawrence Livermore lab for uh, he nuclear did work. bombs. No, and well, nuclear. they tried to emigrate to Canada. They to That's Canada. right. They, they blacklisted him from coming to Canada. Now, I was in the intelligence service when I was a young kid. What we used to do is follow scientists like him around when they traveled abroad, so we make sure they wouldn't defect. Okay, anyway, we were, we were crazy. One of the reasons why it's so easy for me to understand the stupidities of what we're doing now is that when I was 24 years old, I was a top secret control officer. I could stamp <laughs> documents top secret. And when I was 42 years old, the United States Senate, when they sent over the Pentagon Papers, I could only go read them, and there were two guards, and I couldn't take any notes. Can you imagine how unbelievably uh, warped the bureaucracy is that when I'm 24, I could classify and declassify, and when I'm 42, as a United States Senator, I could not take notes, and they were under guard. So, so when you recognize the dangers of our nuclear capability, we were safer when you had man mutual assured destruction between the Soviet Union and the United States. Now, we don't even have that safety. Now what we have is the proliferation of nuclear capability. It's a lot more complex than that. You know, Al Qaeda is not going to get a bomb anytime soon. Maybe a dirty bomb, but not a real bomb. So, but, but what it's done is, and of course this has happened in the United States. I'll just speak about the United States. Uh, and what it's done in the United States since the Second World War, we have moved into a military industrial complex control. Eisenhower uh, warned us of that uh, in, uh, in, and not a single president since has even acknowledged the problem. Jimmy Carter, uh, Clinton, Ray, they don't even acknowledge the problem. And yet today, our country is totally ruled and controlled by, we call it corporate America, but the individual powers within corporate America, the vertical areas of it, are uh, the insurance industry, but primary, and pharmaceutical industry, and others, and Wall Street, but primarily the military industrial complex, which is fissured into the financial industry of Wall Street, and that's who controls our country today. And you'd say, well, boy, that's really unfortunate. Well, that's what happens around the world. All the countries are controlled that way. Canada is, Europe is. Uh, there's only one country that doesn't, uh, two that I know. One is Switzerland, and the other is Costa Rica. Costa Rica made a decision not to have an army. They saw nobody that was threatening them, and so they done very, very well, and a lot of Americans go down there to retire, and also Canadians. So we have a situation in the world where we are totally destabilized. And if there is a culprit, and there is, it's the United States of America. I say this as a 
patriotic American. I enlisted when I was a young man in the service during the Korean War. I was lucky and went as an intelligence officer to Europe. But, but I, I am patriotic. But I consider myself, first and foremost, a globalist. You see what it says up there, global? Well, that's, that's what I am primarily, is a globalist, and I'm only American secondarily. And make no mistake about that, that my patriotism, I love my country, but my patriotism is to the human race above all, rather than to the United States of America. And so now, as I point out, the major threat we have in the world today is the United States itself because of what it does. The United States has become a empire. It has taken the place of uh, the British uh, leadership in the last century. And, uh, and so now we, and, and of course, when you're an empire, you develop the arrogance of empire. And what, uh, you know, we, we, we have, a, Americans have a certain triumphalism. Canadians have a touch of this too. That is, oh, we're better than anybody else in the world. Well, the point of fact, we are made up of everybody else in the world. And, and we are blessed. Canada is blessed, the United States, with a continent, an immigration, uh, resources, independence of not being invaded because of the two oceans. But all of that is ending now because of terrorism that uh, knows no bounds. So that's the worst situation we could be in, and the fact that the United States of America is the agent for destabilization of the world today. Because we have the most influence at the United Nations and the Security Council, and you can see how we misuse and manipulate these good people around the world, these other governments, to follow our leadership to what? I'll give you an example. The class I could use Iraq, which was unbelievable in, in its criminality. George Bush should go to jail with Cheney. There's no question about it. They should be brought to The Hague and tried. But, and so now you have a situation where Iraq and now Afghanistan, and those of you that are holding your breath thinking that Obama is going to save us all, I gotta tell you, Obama, he, put you. <laughs> he, he is not what you think he is. He's a very gifted politician, and he's into power, and that's it. Now, solutions, to really affect solutions, you have to put at risk your power. He does not do that. In fact, I consider him, and I know him, I met him, I've debated him, I consider him a moral coward. And you can see the way he's handled Guantanamo, how he's handled the gays in the military, how he's handled the expense. We are spending more on defense in the United States under Obama, 4% more than under Bush. And we're spending more at any other time in our history except at the peak of the Second World War. That's what we're spending on defense. We spend more, and this, is, this has got to be the dumbest statement in the world. We spend more on defense than all the rest of the world put together and there's not a nation in the world that would threaten us. Now, why are, and Britain in the last century had a policy that they would spend twice what any potential enemy would spend on defense. There, at that particular incident, it was Germany. We spend on defense, you'll, you read the American papers, the media lies, and they're saying 600, 700 million, it's a trillion dollars a year. If you add the nuclear stuff in the energy department, a trillion dollars a year we spend on defense. And it looks like we're going to have a trillion dollar deficit. And, and you saw the meltdown. I could go into that if you want to. We can do it in question and answer. But, but that's the situation that we are in. And we are the leaders, the self-appointed leaders of the world. And we feel it's our obligation to go into any country we want. Now, people will identify this problem with the presidential leadership. That's just the half of it. In 1999, the Congress of the United States 
passed a law called the Silk Road Policy. I doubt that any of you have heard. Okay. Well, what that policy said, that the, the land in the Eurasian continent, the land from China to uh, Europe, that that whole area, the underbelly of Russia, that whole area is an area of vital American interest. Now, isn't that an interesting thing? Nobody can come to the Western Hemisphere because of the Monroe Doctrine, but we can go to any area. And this area, you're talking, these are the stands. And if you wonder how is it that we've got all these military bases all over this area, well, that's because of an act of Congress in 1998 saying that this is our vital interest. So if it's our vital interest, we've got to go there and defend our vital interest. The hell with the people, whether they want us or not, and so what we do is we bribe the leadership to let us in, build the military bases. Mm. And that is what has been going on. Now that's, that's an initiative of the Congress, not the presidency. And so, you, and then of course, we, we can now look at the nuclear meetings that we have. And we're gonna have another one. And this is where Obama makes great statements. And, and, he, and Russia and the United States make a pact that we're gonna lower the amount of weapons that are the trigger at the ready by 200. We got 5,000 that we're, we're supposed to be doing away with, but we never get to do away with them. Why is that? I mean, there's still this mentality of the Cold War, mutual assured destruction. And so if you look another idiotic, you realize that the United States of America has, what, 1,500 nuclear weapons that can be fired in instance, aimed at China, our banker, <laughs> aimed at North Korea, who's not a threat to anybody but themselves, aimed at Iran, and aimed at Russia. Now, is there anything more insane? No human being, no human being of conscience would dare use an atomic bomb again. But we have several thousand pointed at people, instant, instant use. It, it boggles the mind. What, what, where have we advanced to as a human race? And then you say, well, the United States is the most powerful, the most successful country. First off, we're not the most successful at all. You travel around the world and you find, you know, my favorite is Switzerland. But you go to Sweden, Stockholm, Finland, uh, you know, the, the Scandinavian countries, uh, and Canada. You know, you realize your parking system is far superior to anything that I have in the United States? You know, we go enter our money and walk away. We don't have to go back and put the paper in front of your dashboard so a cop can come by and see you. No, you're smarter. You got this all electronically, and so if you're over parked, they can send a cruiser to give you a ticket. Now, that's efficiency. That's Canadian efficiency. We haven't arrived at that yet in the United States. So I could go on at length in talking about the problem, but that's what scholars do. And though I have four books out there, and I consider myself a, uh, a half-assed scholar, so to speak, the, uh, the, the problem is not defining the problem. That's easy. I get to look around and be observant, and you know the problem. Whether it's the media, which is totally controlled by corporate America, and of course does not tell the truth. And uh, so what is the solution? Well, Reason with me now. There's only two avenues, and this is, this works in a constitutional environment or a an environment a parliamentary. Please, and so there's only two possible venues for change in terms of governance. One is the government, which essentially what's controlling world society today is representative government which we call democracies, but they're not democracies. They're really, the best definition is representative government. And so that's where the problem exists. And the structure of representative government is very, very deficient. And what's the only other avenue? The people. So if you're going to look for a solution, don't look to the government, because it cannot correct itself because of human nature. So you have to go to the people. But, you know, 
Canada has this not at all. The United States has 24 states. If you look at the progression of governance, the Swiss started in 1292 with uh, the Bundesbrief, which is the beginnings of a federal system, federation. And then the United States came along with the first written constitution in uh, 1787, and that's a, it's, a, it's not a good constitution. All Americans will tell you our constitution is the greatest. Thing. It's not a good constitution, not even democratic, very, very undemocratic. Keep in mind, Americans put in place slavery for, for perpetuity. Now, that says it all. Slavery is what we thought was the basic economic uh, posture of the United States from the get-go. So, so now you have a situation that, uh, and if you recall, and the next major step was in 1848 when the Swiss, in terms of governance, brought the people into the operation of government as lawmakers. They did not do much lawmaking until the turn of the century. And at the turn of the century, in the United States, a group of states began, and it was as a result of the total, total despicable obscenity of the corruption of, of capitalism and government that progressives got elected and they put in place the initiative, or they, what they called at the time IRR, Initiative Referendum and Recall. Well, you don't need recall. You don't need referendum. All you need is initiative. Because once the people can make a law by initiative, it takes care of anything you want to address. And so these 24 states put it in place, but at the time, and that was a great human advancement, but at the time, they didn't have enough experience to realize that for that to work properly, it must be totally independent of representative government. And so what we have in the United States are 24 states where the process is totally corrupted by the fact that representative government controls the process through the judiciary and through other devices. So that's the next progression. Now, please come in. Please, there's seats over there. Sorry, thank you. Okay. And so that's the progression of human governance. And I'll address on the board. Maybe I want to do that now. Yeah, let's go to the theory. And let me point out. We, in theory, we are all sovereign as individuals. You are sovereign not because it's written on some piece of paper or a law that you call a constitution. You're sovereign because you're born as a human being. You have sentience. And so that's what makes you sovereign. Not a government, not a piece of paper, you're sovereign. And so what we do in our sovereign exercise of this power, we come together and locals in systems of governance. We come together. Here, you come in on the Mayflower. You're a week from landing on land, and you go below deck and say, hey, we're coming to a new land, and we gotta organize ourselves. Let's have a compact. That's all that is. So it's the group that gets together and makes decisions on a majoritarian basis. As they come together, they now invest that unit with their collective sovereignty, which is a notch above individual sovereignty. Because you see, individual sovereignty must be corrected. The first law of freedom is the limitation of freedom. Let me repeat that, you think on that one. The first law of freedom is the limitation of freedom. Otherwise, you will never have freedom, you'll have anarchy. So now we come together as individuals and we form local units of governance. And as it becomes more sophisticated and we get to larger uh, tribes and tribal areas, you develop a state unit of governance. And this goes back historically, all the way back, whether it's a city state or whether it's a whatever. This, now, then at the end of the Age of Enlightenment, we lapsed into the nation state as a unit of government. Now, what should have happened, and the, re the reason why it didn't, is that we should have gone to a global unit of governance. But, and so what we had were, were the tyrants, Napoleon, Chagas Khan, that tried to conquer the areas to have one single. And they always said, oh, I'm for peace. I just gotta kill all the people to get to peace. And so 
We never made the transition from here to there. We're stuck in the nation state unit of governance. Now, if you'll, so this explains it all. This is the pattern. Now, the challenge is to go to the individual in a way that they can act independently of the structures of representative government so that they can, and which, what they do now, is they give a portion of their sovereignty to the local government, they give a portion to state government, and they give a portion to national government. What we need is for the people to go up here and give a portion to global governance, take it away from nation, and move it up here. John Rawls, a great American uh, philosopher, said there's only two things you need to be able to do. And that is to stop governments from oppressing their people, and to stop governments from going to war. You accomplish those two things, man, you, 